Today we are finishing up our series called When Love Seems Impossible. And today's episode is about uh, loving our children when they don't seem very lovable. Hey, it's Amber L.B. Swenson, wife, mother, worrier, overthinker, type A, holding on to God and his promises to get me through the day. Thanks for joining me to explore everyday issues from a biblical perspective so we can all know and love God more. Now, if you have a cuddly little baby in your arms right now, you probably think this is a crazy thing to say. But if you've been a parent for any amount of time, you usually have figured out that our children are not all snuggles and gurgles and coos and smiles. They come with plenty of problems because they're sinful just as we are. And so um, it usually doesn't take too long before we come into one of those hiccups of parenting. It might be a toddler who refuses to stay in bed or even a baby who's colicky or a school-aged child who has decided that they no longer want to go to school or they don't like their teacher or they're not getting along with a friend or whatever. So all throughout our parenting experience, we're going to run into tough spots when it's kind of hard to love your child. And it's a, it's just a difficult season to get through. So I'm going to give you four tips today for getting through the hard parts of parenting. Tip number one, we have to remember to pray. And sometimes I think when we are so overwhelmed with the situation at hand, whatever it is, We forget to do this, and this is the most important thing. We want to bring God into our dilemmas, into our difficult seasons. And we want to keep in mind a couple of different things. Yes, of course, we want to pray for the circumstances. If your child is sick or if um, they're being bullied at school or if they're failing a class, you definitely want to pray for the circumstances. But we don't want to just pray for the circumstances. We also want to pray for our child's heart. Most important is that we pray that they love and follow the Lord. That is way, way more important than any of the circumstances they're going to face. But We want to pray that their heart is tuned to God's word and that they have a heart that cares about others. When a child is being bullied, we want to pray that they learn how to stick up for themselves and defend themselves and also learn how to forgive. Um, If we're having problems with a child who is really not um, following the rules or being mean to other kids, we want to pray and ask God to get rid of that spirit of rebellion in them. Um, Just normal, everyday prayers for our children are things like keep their hearts from being swept up in foolishness or from being caught up in worldly things. We can pray for our children to find godly spouses, to Uh, be part of God's church all the days of their life, to not wander away from the truth. So many things that we can pray for our children. But then we don't want to just stop in praying for our children. We also want to pray for ourselves as a parent or a grandparent. We want to pray for wisdom so that we're able to see what needs to be done or what could help a certain situation. We want to pray for the right words. When we talk to our children or our grandchildren, we certainly want to pray that God would give us words that will help them understand the point that we're trying to make. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we're praying that our children or our grandchildren can see that we are responding in love and that they can feel the love that we're trying to show them. That is something that is so easily missed sometimes. I remember having conversations with my children at, during different seasons when they you know, said something like, you are so not supporting me at all. And I would say, what do you mean I'm not supporting you? I'm the one who's, you know, washing your uniform and packing your lunch and making sure you get to practice. And, um, you know, they were missing those things, that that is part of supporting them and loving them and cheering them on. And so sometimes we just need to pray that the Lord helps them to see the love that we are trying to get across to them if they're not catching it. And then, of course, Um, The last thing, Tad R. Callister said, one of the most meaning things we can do as a parent is teach our children the power of prayer, not just the routine of prayer. So yes, it's so important, you know, to teach your child those um, 
everyday prayers, prayers that you maybe say before a meal or prayers before bed. But I think that's a really important point that Tad has made in that we don't want those routine prayers to just become rote, just something that we're babbling off and they have absolutely no meaning. We could say them, you know, without even thinking one thought. We want to make sure that when we're praying, um, we teach our children to pray from the heart. You are not going to have the same prayer every night because circumstances are changing all around you. So as you have different things coming up, you're going to pray for different things. And even as we read our Bible every night, a lot of times the prayer that I pray um, after reading the Bible is in response to whatever it is that we have prayed. So we want to teach our child and our children to really learn to communicate with God. That's an important part of our job as a parent. Number two, remember that your children have lots of friends but you are their only mother or father or grandma or grandpa. So this can be super, super hard because it's it's tempting to want to be really loved by your child or your grandchild and to want them to look up to you as the fun person. And But, you know, you got to remember that they will have lots of friends who are lots of fun, but Um, you are the one who will discipline them. You are the one who will tell them when something they are doing is not right or when they're headed in the wrong direction. And you may be the only one. And this affects us and impacts us in so many different ways. I remember coming to a point when I realized I had to really think about the, the jobs I was taking, the hours that I was working, um, the the times that I was going out of town because my children only have one mom. So there's lots of women who can fill in and be a speaker for an event. But if one of my children had an important thing going on, I'm the only one who could be their mom who was there for them on that day. So that's one way that we have to remember, you know, that we're the parent and making those choices to really parent our child But we also want to remember that we have a unique perspective in speaking the truth into our children. And this is something that Moses told parents to do, you know, speak to your children on the road when they get up, when they lie down, wherever you're at. Um, We have the unique opportunity to speak truth into our children, to teach them the word of God while they are under our roof. And that is something, again, like I said, that's not their friend's responsibility. And it's a wonderful thing if you have Christian friends who are doing that. But um, it's really the opportunity that we have for a specific time. And I totally understand that this gets so hard sometimes because parenting 24-7 is just Um, you know, overwhelming at times. And sometimes you don't want to deal with your child's issues. You just want sleep. I get that. I totally get that. Katie France said, you are not managing an inconvenience. You are raising a human being. And C.S. Lewis said, children are not a distraction from more important work. They are the most important work. It's so important to remember this as we're going through the hard seasons. As we go through those hard seasons, we can be praying that God helps us to learn the lessons that we're supposed to learn and helps our children to learn the lessons that they're supposed to learn. And in this point, this is when we pray for strength, that God will help us to parent well through the hard seasons. My daughter, um, when she was in eighth grade, she was part of a cross-country team at a private school, and she went to a particular meet where there were only boys that were going to run this event in eighth grade. So instead of running her by herself and running the boys at a separate time, they just decided to stick my daughter in with the boys and run them all together. And of course, as they started off, she was doing just fine. She was keeping up with them, but it was a two mile race. And as, as the race went on, she fell further and further and further behind to the point that I I saw that she was starting to give up because she couldn't keep up with the boys. So she was just going to give up. And so 
when I when I realized that that's where she was at, I grabbed my camera bag and my purse, and I just started running alongside of her until we got a, a safe dif- distance away from the finish line, and then I sent her off by herself. But really, that's the image I want you to have. During the tough seasons, don't walk away from your child. Don't distance yourself from them. That is when you get right up next to them and you tell them that you're in it for the long haul and we're going to get through this together and we're going to run this race together. I'm here. I'm your parent or I'm your grandparent and I'm not going anywhere. And that's a lesson that's going to have a lot of meaning for them all throughout their life because they're going to know that when life gets hard, they can come back to you because you're not going to run away and you're not going to give up and you're not going to go take a nap. You're going to pick up your bag and you're going to run alongside them. These themes that we've been talking about this month, when love seems impossible, are themes that I explored in a novel I wrote called The Bread of Angels. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Megan Martins walked into the cosmetology school and straight into the path of Becky Ellingson, her husband's ex-girlfriend. 20 minutes later, Megan raced out of Hair Nation with half of her head highlighted and the reality that her husband was not who she thought he was. He had a son, a bank account, and jobs to provide child support, which she knew nothing about. Tragedy, controversy, and a new understanding of the human condition await Megan in the tiny town of Ornoco, Minnesota. But so do adventure, hope, and witty friends who bring meaning back to her life. To get a copy of The Bread of Angels, check out our episode notes where you'll find a link or go to amberlbswenson.com. Number three, let your child fail. This is such an important lesson that we have to teach our children. Too many parents try to pick up all the pieces and never let their kids experience the consequences of failing. And this can be tragic when they become teenagers and young adults because when they fail and they're not used to failing, some of them turn to suicide because they have never felt this before. So our job is to teach our children how to fail and what to do when we fail. Talk through the consequences. What happened that led to this failure? Did you fail a test? Okay, did you study for it? How much did you study for it? Did you not understand what was going to be on the test? Um, You know, what could you have done different? These are the lessons that are so important to learn so that we can choose differently the next time. There's a meme that says failures are part of life. If you don't fail, you don't learn. And if you don't learn, you'll never change. Look, both Peter and Judas failed in pretty epic ways with Jesus' suffering and death. Judas betrayed Jesus, of course, and he realized that he had made a big mistake. He he took the money back. He didn't he apologized. I didn't want to do this. I I, I shouldn't have done this. This was wrong. I've betrayed an innocent man. Peter denied knowing the Lord. He understood. He went out and wept bitterly. He, he recognized that he had failed in major ways. What was the difference? Judas committed suicide, didn't think that there was a way back. Peter repented. He put himself in a position that when Jesus was on the shore and reinstated him, Peter accepted God's forgiveness. Peter went on and learned from his uh, mistake and became better as an apostle because of it, learned to never deny the Lord, but to preach God's God's, uh, word boldly. We have to teach our kids that failure is just another part of life, and all throughout their life, they are going to fail. The Napoleon Hill Foundation, in their thought for the day, um, back in March of 2017, I believe, put this, They said Edison failed 10,000 times before perfecting the incandescent electric light bulb. Don't worry if you fail once. Arguably, America's greatest inventor, Thomas Edison, had an extraordinarily positive perception of life that greatly enhanced his ability as an inventor. 
When others might have been hopelessly discouraged after failing thousands of times in an attempt to develop an electric light, the great Edison simply viewed each unsuccessful experiment as the elimination of a solution that wouldn't work, thereby moving him that much closer to a successful solution. We could all take a lesson from Edison. Stories abound about inventors who quit trying and gave up too soon or miners who struck gold just a few feet beyond where someone else quit digging. There are few obstacles in life that will not succumb to consistent, sustained, intelligent, positive action. When you are discouraged after you've failed at something, remember Edison's 10,000 failures before he arrived at the solution that forever changed the world. This is so huge. We have to teach our children how to fail and what to do afterwards. And number four, don't hesitate to get help. We need our Christian friends. My Christian friends have been huge in my life. I can I can send out a little SOS, help, pray for me, pray for my child, pray for this situation. We're really struggling here. I have been wonderfully blessed by the fact that I am part of a Bible study where uh, both my husband and I are in this Bible study and all the other couples are just a little bit older than us. And so their children have been a little bit further ahead in life than ours. And it has been such a beautiful experience because we have been able to learn from their parenting mistakes. And we've been able to learn just from how they are responding to issues in their children's lives, even if they haven't had a parenting mistake or if their child hasn't necessarily made a mistake, but just issues that's, that have come along. And because we've been in this group, this Bible study for so long, you know, we all are constantly sending texts, you know, to pray for this child or or pray for this situation in the family. And it's such a beautiful thing to have a support group like that. I have a child who has dyslexia. It would be silly for me to think that I could handle this on on my own. We we had we got that child the tutoring that they need because there was no way I could teach the coping mechanisms and, and the way to see things. I, I was at a loss. I couldn't do it, so we found somebody who could. When your child is depressed, when they're dealing with anxiety, when they're struggling through whatever situation, don't try to do it on your own if you feel that you're in over your head. Get help send out that smoke signal, get the SOS going, call a pastor, um, find out a counseling center that can help you. I know that there are um, there's a church in our town who offers free family counseling on Thursday nights. And even just one session, sometimes you need that reset. You need to go because you're all sort of squabbling about something or something's really gone on that you, you're not quite sure how to handle. And you just need to have a family therapy session um, to talk things through. Or, or maybe it's just you and one child. Or maybe your child needs to go on their own and just talk to someone about something that's going on. In our neighborhood, we've got such a beautiful thing. I have um, two other Christian parents who are raising their, their children in our neighborhood. And it's a beautiful thing the way all the parents take care of each other's children. And even... You know, there's there's a child in our neighborhood who doesn't have a Christian parent and who actually has a fairly rough upbringing. And the way that we can sort of help that child out, you know, when they're over and they look hungry and we're able to feed them. Or just yesterday, as a matter of fact, it's very cold in Minnesota right now. And I saw this child walking several blocks from home without a jacket, without a hat without gloves. And I pulled alongside the road and because I knew him, um, we've had several years experience with him and his family situation. I said, where are you going? Hop in the car. I'll take you there. I'll make sure you get there. Um, you know, just looking out for each other's children and um, working together. You know, one of the neat things about the Bible is we see Mary and Joseph did this. Now, granted, they lost their child, and that's how we know that they did it. But 
um, you know, they were all in a group traveling to Jerusalem for the Passover and then back from Jerusalem. And that's why they didn't notice right away that Jesus was gone. He wasn't in the group because they were all traveling together. And that's a really perfect way to raise your children. I know for us, we were part of this amazing church raising our children that um, our best friends in life were the friends that were helping us to teach Sunday school and walking alongside of us and and helping out on Wednesday nights with catechism and Bible history. And we were all doing church together. We were all raising our children together. And our children were all best friends. And it, it was just a beautiful experience. And especially, man, especially if you are a single parent, please don't try to do this alone. It's just too hard. It's hard enough when there are two parents and grandparents and everybody's on the same page. If you're a single parent, first of all, hats off to you. Thank you for all you've done and all that you are doing. And um, and God bless you for that. But don't hesitate to reach out. When you are at the end of your rope or when you're in a situation that is bigger than you are, get the help that you need. Parenting can be a wonderful, wonderful experience, and man, um, it comes with so many blessings and so many gifts, and it's just a beautiful thing when you see your child finally, you know, doing their thing and and getting in their career and establishing themselves or finding their spouse and all those wonderful things. Those are beautiful, but it's a long way to get there, so don't forget to pray. Remember to be the parent, let your child fail and teach them how to deal with it and don't hesitate to get help. This has been Little Things because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. Thanks for listening to the When Love Seems Impossible series. I hope you found it beneficial and have some takeaways that you've been able to apply to your life. It always helps me to remember that Christ died for me when I had nothing to offer him. And I want to share that same sort of love with other people. Don't worry, there's still lots of great subjects coming up in the episodes ahead. So please continue to stick with us and listen to Little Things. As always, thank you for listening to Little Things. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast so that other people can discover it too. We love hearing your feedback. And as always, if you know of a friend or a family member or someone that really needs to hear this message, would you consider sharing it with them? Thank you for your prayers. They really keep us going here at Time of Grace as we continue to share the good news about Jesus.